One of the big questions about Hanukkah, 
that I'm often asked is, how do you spell it? So let's take another vote. We took a vote on uh, which menorah to light first. Which way of spelling Hanukkah is correct? You can choose the color. Which color is correct? You like the red one? OK. All right. I mean, I like the red one. All right, we got a few reds. Yellow? Blue? Green? Orange? All of them. All of them. Hanukkah, or the black, the darker green, gray. None of them? Is light blue here? How many like that one? You think that's the right one? They're all right? How many think they're all right? How many think they're all wrong? Okay, I don't think we got 100% consensus there, one way or the other. Okay, how it's supposed to be spelt is that. That is the correct way to spell Hanukkah. And so you got the, the chet, the nun, the kaf, and the he. Now, the reason that you can spell it lots of different ways in English is, well, for one thing, the, the chet makes the ch sound. It's literally Hanukkah. That's the right way to say it, Hanukkah. And, uh, and so that letter has the ch sound. Uh, we don't have it in English, that ch sound. Uh, it's in some other languages, uh, like John Sebastian Bach, right? Or the Loch Ness Monster, right? And so that, that's that same sound that, uh, that we just don't have in English. So since we don't have it in English, how do you make, how do you spell it if you don't have that sound in English? So it's kind of like an H, so some will put the H in there, but it does have more of a k, cha, Hanukkah. So, some will spell it with a ch, but then you got people saying chanuka, and uh, and so then you got the kh version, which uh, which helps a little bit, um, uh, but there's no real way to get that ch sound spelled because we don't have that sound in English and no letter for that sound in English, and so that's why you get several different variations, and then uh, the double n's or the double k's, it it, it could also go that way, uh, hanuk. To break up the last two syllables, Anukka, and it could be that way. Uh, also, the N can be in both syllables, and so uh, there's a few different ways that you can spell it. But the, uh, but it takes a lot of English letters. No matter how you do it, they come up with those four simple he Hebrew letters, and uh, and so that's why there's lots of different ways to spell it, and you'll see it lots of different ways uh, because of the Hebrew to English translation. All right, a little story here. Santa coming down the chimney, and he uh, enters the wrong house. He says, sorry, wrong house. And there they're lighting their Hanukkah. And, uh, and so the, the father says to Santa, well, no, 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 this might be a divine providence. Come on in, come on in, sit down. And so, uh, so Santa's embarrassed, so he sits down. And, uh, and so he starts asking questions about what they're doing and about the holiday. And he starts to explain it all. And, uh, and he says, what's this here on the table? And they say, oh, it's latkes. Would you like to try one? Oh, and he tries a latke. And he says, oh, this is so much better than the cookies that people give me. <laughs> and, uh, and so by the time the night is over, he ends up spending hours there. And by the time the night is over, he converts. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no more ho, ho, ho. It's now ho, ho, ho. <laughs> and he, now there's new songs coming out because of this transformation that's taking place. No longer joy to the world, it's now oi to the world. And other great classics that have been rearranged for the new, the new Santa.
going along with that uh, kind of theme of, of Santa and that whole other holiday of December, does anyone know who the, uh, who were the three wise, what were the names of the three wise men? What were their names? It's in the Bible. Lou Wiseman, Irving Wiseman, and Samuel Wiseman. And so that's the three wise men of the Bible. So, you know, it comes down to the translation. It's how you, you know, it's translating it there. That's it. Okay. Now, the word Hanukkah means dedication. That's what it means in Hebrew. It's dedication. And so throughout the Bible, where you'll see the word dedication could be dedicating anything, it's the word Hanukkah. So it's not only used for the holiday, but it's just the word dedication. That's used, like I said, uh, in everyday you know, talk or whatever you might dedicate. Uh, but as we went over the story last week in depth, and we won't have time tonight, the Maccabees, the, the temple was... Uh, and Israel was uh, under the occupation of the, of the Greek Syrians, and um, the temple was uh, desecrated, the pieces of furniture were taken out, and idols were put in, and the Maccabees fought against the armies, and they miraculously won the battle, and that's really the, the miracle of Hanukkah, is that they fought against amazing odds, against the most powerful nation of the then known world, and, and won. And even though they were very small in number, were not allowed to have any, any weapons, uh, but they won the battle. And one of the important aspects that we talked about last week was they didn't start the battle, they didn't start the revolt until it came down to the issue of restricting their religious freedoms. We were under occupation under the Babylonians, under the uh, Persians, and then under the, the Greeks, for many years, hundreds of years, without revolting. But then when Antioch Epiphanes, one of the newest king, uh, the next king in uh, the Greek Syrian Empire, began to restrict our ability to worship God, outlawed circumcision, outlawed Sabbath keeping, outlawed uh, uh, the kosher rituals, and then began to try to force us to disobey the Torah, to disobey God's law, that's when the red line was drawn, that's when the revolt took place. And that's when God blessed and we won. A lot of people try and hijack the Hanukkah theme and make it a, uh, a, 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 um, a holiday and a festival of, of liberation. Uh, and they would, you know, just everyone who wants to be liberated will then claim, well, hey, they were able to do it and they won and, and so we'll claim that theme and that banner. And it but it really isn't just about liberation. It wasn't for economic liberation. It wasn't for political liberation. Like I said, we didn't have either one of those for, for hundreds of years under those other occupations. It wasn't for those things. It was for religious liberty so that we could worship God according to the dictates of our conscience. That's what was important. And that's where, again, the red line was drawn. And uh, if I uh, understand the Bible correctly, and history, how history repeats itself, uh, there will come a time again where our religious liberties will be restricted and we will not have the freedoms that we have today to worship God according to the Bible, according to the dictates of our conscience. And so it's important for us to, to uh, be practicing God's word now, to be able to be prepared to stand and to obey God over any, I believe we need to obey the laws of the land, whatever land we live in, until it contradicts the laws of the Bible. That's the red line. God is above. We can, we can pledge our allegiance to the United States. We can pledge our allegiance to America. We can pledge our allegiance to our spouse. But our supreme allegiance needs to be to God. We can have lots of other allegiances. You can you know, sign a contract at work or whatever, a mortgage contract. You can have some other allegiances. But our supreme allegiance is to God. And he trumps them all. And if we're asked, we're trying to be forced to disobey God 
That's when all the other contracts are broken. And that's how the Maccabees saw it. And they won the battle. And so when they won the battles, several battles, three years of battles, which is relatively short, again, especially how outnumbered we were, and uh, they liberated the temple, took out the idols, and rededicated the temple back to God. And that's why it's called Hanukkah, because we were rededicating the temple. The de temple had already been dedicated when it had been built. A similar temple on the same spot was built by Solomon many years before. And that was destroyed by the Babylonians and then rebuilt by Nehemiah and Ezra. And they dedicated that rebuilt temple. But then when it was desecrated, it wasn't destroyed, but it was just desecrated. When the Maccabees came in and the Maccabees then liberated it, they just needed to rededicate it. And some of us have been dedicated to the Lord. Maybe our parents had dedicated us to the Lord. Maybe when we were conceived, they had dedicated us to the Lord and, and prayed over us while we were in the womb. Or maybe when we were born, uh, they had a dedication service for us and blessed us and prayed for us. Uh, or maybe um, uh, we went through a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah and were dedicated to the Lord. Or maybe at some point in time, we as adults uh, or mature youth dedicated ourselves to the Lord. But maybe between whatever that time was and today, you began to stray from that dedication and turned your back on God at some point in time and rebelled against God, I invite you to allow God to cleanse out of you any of the defilement that you've brought into your mind or to your heart, any desires that you've had for things that are not in harmony with God's word. You didn't have to have someone force you to disobey God's law, but you willingly chose to. I invite you to Tonight, as we continue on, don't wait for a special time, but as God moves upon your heart and mind to rededicate Hanukkah, dedicate yourself onto the Lord. Commit your ways onto the Lord. Ask Him to be your supreme God. Ask Him to be your guide and to lead you and direct you in all the paths He has for you and to show you His plan for you. Allow him to work in your life. So that's what Hanukkah, the essence of it is, the essence of the word Hanukkah, the dedicating of the temple to the Lord, to the worship of the Lord. And the first thing that they dedicated was the altar for burning the sacrifices. Because as we need to allow God to cleanse us, one of the things that were used to dedicate each piece, each piece of furniture in the sanctuary was blood. As God commanded in his word, in his law, to sacrifice an animal, to take their blood, and to sprinkle it on the pieces of furniture, dedicating them and spiritually cleansing them from the defilement and anointing them to the Lord, claiming them for the Lord. Because in God's system, defilement and sin can only be cleansed by the death of well, the, of the, the sinner who sins needs to die. The Bible says, he who sins shall die. And that was the punishment to Adam and Eve right from the very beginning. If you disobey me, God told them, you will surely die. But then God provided a provision, a, an atonement, a substitute in our place. And for centuries it was the animal sacrifices of a lamb, a kosher animal, to be sacrificed in our place, to bear the punishment for us. All of that foreshadowing the Messiah to come, that his blood would be shed in place of us. It would be a blood sacrifice. And so the blood, so they understood that, they understood that theme, and so the first thing they dedicated, and the first thing they set back up was the altar to sacrifice the animals that had been offered since the time of Adam and Eve all the way down the line. Similar type of atonement theme is with Abraham. God told Abraham to offer his son Isaac, and in place of his son Isaac, God provided a ram as a substitute, as an atonement in place of. And then also, among the pieces of furniture, they dedicated 
the menorah, the lampstand. And the lampstand was kept burning with oil. It was oil that they burned. They didn't have the wax candles. They had oil that was burned. And oil is another thing that is used throughout the Bible in dedicating or anointing things. The, the, the king was anointed with oil. The prophets were anointed with oil. The Kohanim, the Levites, the priests were anointed with oil. And so this anointing, this dedication, so this theme of dedication, is also this, this theme of this covering with blood and with oil and sacrifice. And so the oil is an important theme in the Hanukkah festival. Now there is a story that comes along and it's in the Talmud that says that uh, the miracle of Hanukkah was that in lighting this menorah, and this menorah, the seven-branch menorah of the, of the sanctuary, of the temple, was to be lit near Talmud all the time, continually, burning all the time, never to be put out, never to be blown out, kept burning all of the time. And so when they rededicated it, they needed the special oil for the temple. The oil for the temple was the first press uh, from, the, from the, oil wine, the, the, oil, the, the olive press. They'd press out the olives, and the first pressing was for the temple. And then the second press was for eating, and the third pressing was for other, item, other things, anointings, and then fourth and for uh, animals and healings. And so oil was used for a lot of different things. But the first press was dedicated to the Lord or the temple. And they only had enough oil to burn the menorah for one night. And the story goes on that it would take eight nights for them to be able to get more oil and to get it ready and press it and prepare it for the temple. And so a little debate took place. We've liberated the temple. We've offered the sacrifice. Should we light the menorah now with just the one, enough for one day? Or should we wait until we have enough to keep it burning continually? And they decided to burn it for that day, to burn that one, enough for one, and then work on getting the rest later. And so they did that. They poured it into the seven branches, and they lit it, and it burned. And the story goes on that it continued to burn for the entire eight days um, until they were able to get more oil. And that is... Uh, pretty popular theme of the miracle of Hanukkah. And I have no doubt that God can do that. God can do lots of things. God's done that tons of times uh, in the Bible and in current days, where he has helped things to stretch much longer and provide for us beyond normal understanding. God is amazing. God is able to do that. That's a pretty simple miracle for God to do. Uh, so I don't doubt that God could do that, and I don't doubt that God did that. God might very well done that. But whether, even if he did do that, that is not the miracle of Hanukkah. The miracle of Hanukkah is that God placed in people's hearts a desire to serve him more importantly than anything else. More importantly than their life, more importantly than, than, uh, than, than uh, ease and comfort. Willing to go to war, and many of them died for the years so that they could worship God. That's the miracle. That God has people who love him so much that he is the most important thing in the world. That's the real miracle of Hanukkah. And then that we won is a secondary miracle of Hanukkah. And I don't doubt that this is a third, you know, miracle as well. But the focus has come on to the, these eight days of oil burning. And there might be some reasons for that. A lot of the last 2,000 years, we've been under occupation. And, you know, if you're under occupation and spread throughout the world, and here you are each year cele celebrating a time when your people revolted against the occupying force and won, it might not sit so well with, with the country that you're under. Um, the uh, rabbi from uh, England, the chief rabbi of, of, of London, his theory is that, uh, which could be right too, or part of it as well, is that the rabbis down the ages would look back on the Maccabees, and the Maccabees, while they won the war, and each one of the five brothers eventually died in battle, but one of them, I think, was the last one, when he was reigning as king, he not only anointed himself as, as the, uh, the, he made it both together, king and priest together, uniting the two where 
Biblically, they're to be separated. The king line through Judah and the priest line through Aaron and through the Levites. And so they kind of might have downplayed that aspect, and that could be as well. Uh, the Maccabees were able to liberate and rule for about 100 years before the Romans came in and, and crushed that. And so that's some of the story and more of the story of Hanukkah and the, the, the lights and the candle lighting. And the, but the real reason, I believe, that for the eight days is not because the candles that came, kept burning for eight days, and that's, again, the traditional reason that's given why we celebrate it for eight days, is, well, these candles kept burning for eight days. But as we look biblically, dedication, again, that's what Hanukkah means, dedication, things dedicated in the Bible are dedicated on the eighth day. When is a male child circumcised? The eighth day. You couldn't sacrifice an animal until the eighth day. Uh, the temple, the, the, the temple that Solomon built, he dedicated it during an eight-day holiday, during Sukkot. And so he dedicated it for eight days. That whole Sukkot time was when he set up the dedication. And so we see the dedication throughout the Bible, things being dedicated, the temple, people, animals, being dedicated uh, for eight days. And, and so I believe that's why the, the Maccabees, again, being very religious people, they would have read the Bible and they would have seen, well, things that are dedicated. Solomon dedicated the temple. He dedicated it for eight days. So we're going to rededicate it for eight days. And I believe that's why it lasts eight days, and that's why it, we need to burn for eight days and, and, uh, and why we celebrate it for eight days. Plus, that way you get a whole lot more gifts. So it's, it's good to do the eight days. You know, it works out nice. And that way it always falls over a Sabbath. So there's a lot of good reasons to celebrate it for eight days. So we covered why there's seven branches on some menorahs. Did I cover that? I said, right? There are some menorahs. You've seen some menorahs. Like here's a menorah. This one is outside of, in, in Jerusalem, just outside the western wall. Uh, those people behind Barbara over there, they're looking down at the western wall at uh, seven branch menorah. That's like what they, they, uh, they built. I got another picture there. Yep, here's another one. This is right outside, also in Jerusalem right outside the Knesset building, the, the Israeli parliament, the Israeli government building, is uh, this big seven-branch menorah. And so we see these seven-branch menorahs, again, in Israel and Jerusalem and other places. The reason for the seven-branch menorah is because that's what was in the temple. That's what God told Moses to put into the temple. God gave the instructions of how to build the temple, and Moses wrote it down, and what was to be in the temple was a seven-branch menorah. And so the menorah that the Maccabees rededicated and lit was a seven-branch menorah. It's actually also a, uh, a monument in Rome uh, depicting the Roman destruction of the of Jerusalem temple and them carrying the Jews captive and, and, and taking some of the pieces of furniture and it's on uh, uh, the arch there, um, Titus's arch, of them carrying the seven-branch menorah. And so... A lot of different ways we see the seven branch. We covered why the eight days, why we celebrate it for eight days, but why then on the Hanukkah menorah, the Hanukkahs, why do we have nine branches, nine candles? That's the next question. We understand the seven, we understand the eight, but what about the nine? Well, the nine branches, there's eight lower ones, and they represent the eight days, then there's one that stands apart, that stands higher. Matter, uh, it's not always in the middle. On some menorahs, it's to the side or in the front, but it's offset and higher. And it's called the shamus candle, and the shamus means servant. And so that's the one we use to light the other candles. So we light the shamus candle, and then we use that one to light the other candles, both outside in the big menorah, and that's what we did here, using the shamus. So the shamus is the servant candle that lights the other candles. So that's why we have nine. One for the shamas, and one for each day, the eight days, making nine. Now, an interesting thing about this shamas candle, in Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, it talks about a servant. It says, my servant shall prosper, be exalted and raised to great heights, just like the shamas candle, higher than all the rest. But yet just as many were appalled at him, my righteous servant 
makes many others righteous. Just as that Shamus candle lights other candles, here's this prophecy that the, sh the servant is going to make others, this righteous servant is going to make others righteous. It is their punishment that he bears. He exposed himself to death. He bore the guilt of many and made intercession for sinners. Well, just as we talked about, when, they, when the Maccabees rededicated the temple, they built the altar because of the blood sacrifice that would make atonement, that would pay the price for, that would receive the punishment for the people's sins. And here the prophet Isaiah, the Jewish prophet Isaiah, is saying that very thing. He's saying this righteous servant is going to make other people righteous by receiving their punishment, by dying like that lamb, and bearing the guilt of the other people. And so the servant receives other people's guilt for the sins that they committed, just like the lamb would do. And Ben, again, back from Adam and Eve, right on through Abraham and Moses, all the way down through David, Solomon, all the way through the animal sacrifice, bearing the guilt, dying, and bearing the guilt of the people. But here, he's not saying a lamb. He's saying, my servant, my righteous servant, will do the very thing that those animal sacrifices did. He would bear our guilt, he would bear our punishment, and die for the sins that we committed. Thus, we are freed, we are cleansed, like the temple was cleansed of the defilement. So that defilement had to be removed, placed upon him, removed from us, and then replaced with God's pieces of furniture into the new temple, rededicated temple, and same with us. God's word then has to come in and replace the things of this world that God, we allowed God to take out. And thus, my righteous servant makes many righteous. It's like the one candle lights the others. God transforms us, touches us, comes into us as we invite him in, and he changes us, and he makes us righteous day by day, process as quick as we'll allow him to do it, changes us little by little throughout our lives, making us more and more like him. Now, the, uh, the Hanukkah, the, word, the, the Feast of Hanukkah that we're celebrating tonight, is mentioned only in one place in all the Bible. And it's in the book of John, chapter, 22, chapter 10, verse 22. It says, it was the Feast of Dedication. That's what Hanukkah means. That's the word there. It was the Feast of Hanukkah in Jerusalem, and it was winter. You know, it doesn't feel like winter here in Florida. But it was winter. And Yeshua walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. And the people asked him, are you the Messiah? And he gave him a very clear, very plain answer in the affirmative. That yes, he is the Messiah. And Yeshua also said something interesting about himself. He said, I am the light of the world. Claim to be the light of the world. But he also said in another place, he says, you are the light of the world. He says, I am the light of the world in John chapter 8. Just a little bit before where it was Hanukkah and he was mentioning that in the temple. But in Matthew chapter 5 verse 14 it says, you are the light of the world. Well, which one is it? Is he the light, or are we the light? Both. You guys want to have it all. You want to play it safe. It is, it's both. He is the light. He is the shamus light. He is the servant light. He is the uplifted light. He is the servant that died for the sins and guilt of the people. But through his light, that Shamus light, he lights us and makes us lights as well. The other eight lights don't have any light of their own. They only get light as the Shamus gives them light. It's not their own light. They don't produce it. The Shamus gives them their light. 
And any good deed that we are uh, able to perform or do is only because God did it through us. He is the light that lightens us, that makes us light, that gives us light, that gives us his presence, that gives us joy, that gives us peace, that gives us presence, his presence, and, and gives us his power and his victory to be able to stand and stand for him. He is the ultimate one. And through him, he makes the many righteous. He comes and he touches us as we allow him to come in contact with us. The shaman's candle has to come in contact with the other candle. And if we allow him to come in contact with us and invite him to set us on fire for him, we will glow brightly for him. We will shine brightly for him. And you notice the menorahs, they, bright, they burn brighter when, when all the nine candles are burning together. Each one of us represents one of those lights. God wants us to be together and fellowship together and worship him together and serve him together. And as we do that, it burns much more brightly than just this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. It's God's light that he lights us with. And as we unite together, we shine brightly for him. And so as we pray... So in this portion of the message portion of the service, we're going to now do some dancing and singing. We're also going to dedicate a baby tonight. Um, but uh, I'd like to say a word of prayer and give you an opportunity to dedicate. If you've never dedicated yourself to God, if you've never asked him to be your Lord, to be your God, to be your sacrifice, to grant you forgiveness, to remove your guilt, to remove your sins and the power that sin has had over you, I'd like to invite you right now to, to dedicate your heart to God. And if you've dedicated your heart to God in the past, I'll invite you to rededicate your, your heart and your life to the Lord to serve Him even more fully, that the light will shine even more brightly, that God will continue His work of making you righteous for Him. We don't plateau, but we continually grow in Him. We continually allow him to show us what is in our life that needs to be removed and allow him to cleanse it and fill us. And also for those here that might have dedicated themselves at one point but then slipped away and, and, they want, and you want to recommit, rededicate your life to the Lord, I'll invite you to do so as well. Whatever area, whatever one of those three apply to you as we, as we pray together. Our Lord and our God, King of the universe. Lord, I'm thankful for your love and I'm thankful for your word and I'm thankful for the history and I'm thankful for the miracles that you've wrought in our past. I'm thankful, Lord, that you gave the Maccabees and those that stood with them the courage and the strength to stand by you and to stand by your word. That you lit them on fire and here over 2,000 years later we are remembering them and commemorating the acts that you did through them. Lord, we're thankful for the temple and thank you that you were able to enter in and, and be that sacrifice for us. Lord, we want to commit our lives to you. We want to dedicate our lives to you. We want to ask that you would cleanse us of all defilement that has come in, whether it's come in through our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, or whether through our choices that we have made. Lord, cleanse us, cleanse the defilement, cleanse the error, cleanse the sin, cleanse, cleanse everything that's not of you, that everything that's not of your word, that everything that's not of heaven, and remove it from us. And Lord, fill our minds and our hearts and our bodies with your presence, with your light, with your spirit, with your oil. Anoint us and empower us and transform us and change us more and more into your righteous image. And use us, Lord, as shining lights for you. And may we shine brightly, unitedly, for your kingdom and for your sake.